Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Casanova Brown, starring Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, and Joan Bennett. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil D. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When you hear the name of Casanova, you probably think of him as a notorious Italian lover of the 18th century. But he was a lot more than that. He was an author and a diplomat and a man of learning and good taste. And while his life was not without its lurid side, he ended as an innocent librarian. In tonight's play, you meet his namesake and descendant, Casanova Brown. What Casanova's record is in amorous adventure, you are about to learn. But like the earlier Casanova, he too is a man of taste and learning, and most decidedly a family man, which may go somewhat oddly with the Casanova name. And he is Gary Cooper. So Gary plays Casanova Brown in tonight's production of that current international picture. Co-starred with Gary is charming Joan Bennett and the versatile Thomas Mitchell. Together they bring us the memoirs of a modern Casanova. I won't tell you more than that, except to say that when Gary worked for me making the story of Dr. Wassell, I put him through some very difficult predicaments, but none so odd as in tonight's play, where he finds himself taking care of a three-week-old baby. Gary tells me that uh, his fan mail now gives him advice on baby care. I don't know whether those letters mention washing baby woolens in Lux Flakes, But a 70-year-old lady writes me that she has knit over 150 pairs of socks for men in the service. She says I wash them all in Lux Flakes just as soon as I finish each pair so that they'll be pleasanter to wear. To that kind lady should go a reward for both her patriotism and her good taste. And now it's curtain time again. And here's Act One of Casanova Brown, starring Gary Cooper as Kaz, Thomas Mitchell as J.J., and Joan Bennett, as Isabel. Isabel, you, you've got to listen to me. It was all a terrible action, and I know, but it doesn't have to come between us. Oh, Cal. Look, I'll make up for it somehow. I'll... Oh, Cal, why did you have to spoil it all? But nothing spoiled, really, Isabel. <laughs> or, or is it? Look at me. No. No. All right, Isabel. I'm sorry for everything. I'm sorry we ever met each other. And I'm sorry for what I couldn't help. Goodbye, Isabel. Goodbye, Cass. Well, he's lost her. Another romance on the rock. The original Casanova would have kissed away the lady's tears and swept her back into his arms. But our Casanova, Casanova Brown, simply sighed, went to the Grand Central Station and bought a one-way ticket for his hometown. Now, in Rossmore, Illinois, he's getting off the train, and running up to meet him is a different young lady. Cass! Cass! Cass, darling! Oh, Madge. Don't ever let me out of your sight again, please. Why, darling, what is it? Is something the matter? I was crazy to go away and leave you. I'm not safe without you, Madge. Oh, well, darling, we're together again. And it's true what you said in your telegram. Is what true? That you want us to get married right away and settle down and have a happy, quiet life together. A nice, quiet life together, Madge. But darling, you're all upset. You'll get a good night's rest, and tomorrow you can talk to Dad. Talk to J.J.? Why? Well, isn't the prospective groom supposed to ask permission of the bride's father? But, uh, J.J.? I know, but it's merely a formality. Tomorrow, darling, Tomorrow. <laughs> And I've just about reached the end of my patience. It's intolerable that I should continually be called... Oh, wait a pressure. minute, darling. There's the someone in there with Dad. It's an apparently endless series of vulgar accusations. And now I'm afraid I must ask you to leave. But, Grandpa, somebody took my piggy bank. If I hear another word about that blasted piggy bank of yours, I'll flatten your mechano set. 
Did you hear that? Oh, Dad's always angry since Mother and I put him on an allowance. Well, don't you think we ought to wait for a more propitious moment if he's already angry? Oh, it's just a blast, that grizzly bear stuff. He really loves us very much. I do not. I enjoy you, that's all. <laughs> Kaz wants to talk to you, Dad. Uh, oh, oh, oh. oh. Hello, Kaz. How are you, J.J.? Well, Madge, there's no call for your putting your nose into this, is there? <laughs> None whatever, Dad. I'll see you downstairs, Kaz. What a revolting female she is. Well, sit down, Kaz. Here, take my chair. Thanks, J.J. Ouch! Uh, what's the matter? Uh, something under the cushion. Whoa! A piggy bank. Piggy bank? Odd place to put it. Well, Kaz, what can I do for you? Well, you know, I've missed our little talk since you went east. Not that I was the sole reason for your frequent visits. Uh, that was... Uh, oh, was going to, uh... it's quite all right, Kaz. I've not been blind to this little deadfall magic set for you, my boy. But you're much too intelligent to be taken in by that very female. Well, perhaps I'd better make my position clear, J.J. By all means, Cass. Well, uh, you've known me. You've known my family for a good many years. Oh, yes. We've uh, never been well-to-do, but we've always maintained a certain respectability. Proud but poor, I suppose you might describe us. Of course. If the poor can get any satisfaction out of being proud, why not? Cost nothing. Uh, my salary as professor of literature isn't munificent, but it's adequate. And as for my character, I believe I behave reasonably. I'm not overly susceptible to girls. So what? The point of this whole thing seems to have eluded me somewhere. Uh, I'm simply trying to tell you that I want to marry her. Marry whom? Marry Madge, of course. Madge? You out of your mind? I am not. For whatever on earth for? Well, because I love her, of course. Love Madge? Oh, come now, Kaz. That's just downright silly. You must have a better reason than that. What is it, her money? No, just because a minute. Because if it is, you might just as well forget the whole matter. I had precisely the same idea with her mother. I haven't the slightest interest in Madge's money. Oh, they've got it all right. Buckets of it. By George, I've dreamed about that dough just to get my mitts into that cash box for ten minutes. But no, no, no. No, they turn me down cold. I'll never forgive them, Kaz. Never. And I think you got exactly what you deserved for being a shameless, unmitigated scoundrel. I suppose so, but it was a bit of disappointment, just the same. Mrs. Ferris has already given her consent. Then I used to dream about outliving her. Just sit it out, as it were. But along came Madge and her sister, and now her odious little boy. It's no use, Kaz. I tell you, they're eternal. All of them. Listen, J.J., yes or no, just for the record. No. But you'll probably go right ahead and marry that repulsive female anyway. When is the hanging to take place? In June. Mrs. Ferris wants us to wait. And uh, thanks a lot for giving us your blessing, J.J. All right. Hey, now, wait a minute. Kaz, I... Where did I put that urchin's piggy bank? <laughs> Who is it? Oh, hiya, J.J. Time for the rehearsal? Yeah, just about. Brought you up the morning mail. Uh, thanks. Look, Kaz, you still got time to crash out of this booby trap. There's a fast train leaving for Chicago. By one o'clock, you could be across the border into Canada. It's no use, J.J. This is the day before my wedding, and I refuse to be demoralized by a cold-blooded sinner like you. They cut my allowance again today. Down to $25 now. Good. The shape of things to come, my boy. Now, where else could you get $25 a week just by sitting around developing stomach ulcers? Look through that mail while I finish up, will you, J.J.? Uh-huh. Well, they're just bills. Bills and ads. Willow Street Cleaners. New York University. Ellen Harris Maternity Hospital. North Haven Country. Well, I'll be shoving along, Cass. Anything I can do to ease your misery? No, nope, thank you, J.J. See you in church. Uh-huh. Underation, eh? This is going too far. Huh? That, that letter, where is it? This, uh, uh, see here, Cass. Are you planning already to have a family? Would you object to minding your own business? This is my business. How many grandchildren he has is every man's business. And if you're negotiating already with a maternity hospital... What? Let me see that letter. Some men say they can't have too many grandchildren, but I, I'm one that can. Huh. Don't you know an ad when you see one? Ad? Well, they've got a nerve. Let's see. 
What excuse they give for soliciting a man's business before he's even married? Sounds unethical to me. Mr. Casanova Q. Brown. Dear sir. Hmm. Well, this is rather a sinister method of solicitation. Listen to this. A matter of personal importance and one which I would rather not take up in correspondence unless you prefer. Uh, you know, Kaz, I was involved in a little blackmail accident at one time. The letter sounded exactly like this. Uh, I suggest that at your earliest convenience, you call at the hospital and consult with me. Cordially yours, Martha Zernicke, M.D. Let me see that. You don't know this female or this hospital? Never heard of either. Strange, very strange. Hey, great Scott, the time. We're going to be late for the wedding rehearsal. Holy smoke. Hand me that tie, J.J. Well... Here's the sucker. Oh, John, I do wish you wouldn't refer to Kaz like that. I said, here's the sucker. When do we test the scaffold? We're starting the rehearsal right away. Mr. Ferris, will you take your place beside Mrs. Ferris? Now, will everybody get ready, please? Everybody get ready. Uh, just a minute, Kaz. If, if this was a mistake, how will they get your address? Uh, I don't know anything about it. You didn't write to them asking about prices or anything like that? No, of course not. They're waiting for you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Ferris, up beside the bride, please. Fill up the gap. Lovely. 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 Uh, Madge, do you know anything about the Ellen Harris Maternity Hospital in Chicago? Oh, please. Don't rush, Bride. Keep it stairs. Oh, straighten up, Bruce. Must have Seems that somebody's counting on you having quite a family. Yes, for heaven's sake. About ready, Doctor. Splendid, splendid. Now, may we have quiet, please? And another thing, Cass. What about the Q? Q? Yeah, if it was a mistake, how did they get your middle initial? Father. What? The rehearsal. Is he all right? I heard that. Oh, quiet, please. Please. Someday somebody's going to say that just once too often. Dad. Suppose somebody asked you if you were out of your mind. How would you feel and how would you prove you weren't? Oh, John, dear. Huh? Cass. Cass, what is it? Oh, I, I'm sorry. I don't feel very well. Well, Kaz, darling. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll... Please excuse me for a few minutes. Kaz! Well, I don't wonder. If I was in his shoes, I'd certainly feel nauseated. Hey, Kaz, wait for me. Close the door, J.J., and lock it. Now, look, Kaz. If that letter's a mistake, we're in a position to knock off quite a little quick dough. They can't run around scaring the pants off young bridegrooms. We'll threaten to sue them, then we'll settle out of court. Why not? Well, because it uh, may not be a mistake. But of course it's a mistake. What'd you say? I said it may not be a mistake. Oh. 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 What gives, Garrett? I don't know. I tried to call her on the phone long distance, but she wasn't there. Call whom? I just don't know what to do. Yes, if you fail to touch a base somewhere... I'm not without a measure of experience. No, no, no. Nothing like that, J.J. Yes? I'm in a very, a very peculiar situation. Listen, can I trust you to keep your mouth shut about this? Oh, of course, Kat. The trouble is, I, I just can't be sure. I mean, why Chicago? I don't know. Why? If it had been New York? Yes. But uh, Chicago? Uh, if you don't mind my saying so, Kat, I don't seem to have anything to keep my mouth shut on. Look, uh... Last year, I wrote a book about that scandalous ancestor of mine called uh, Casanova in Florence. Well, now, Kaz, uh, don't you think we can skip the high-minded aspects and get strictly down to the nubbin? Uh, I took the manuscript to New York, and while I was there, I uh, met a girl. Ah, ah, we're getting somewhere. Isabel. Isabel, eh? What was she like? Well, have you ever seen the sun come up at dawn? Yes, I have. It curdled my stomach. Well, I liked the way she walked, and her eyes her, her eyes were like burnt charred embers at a field of snow. Hmm, large face, eh? She was going to a college in the city. Well, what was the score at this point? Well, I... I was driving her home one night in a car that I had rented. Oh, it's such a lovely night. Oh, nice moon. Makes you sort of hate to go indoors. Well, why go indoors? It's early yet. How about driving up the river? Oh, I'd love to. Well, that is, if you think it's all right. Why wouldn't it be all right? 
I mean, you probably got a girl back home. Girl back home? Well, haven't you? Well, no. That is, well, well yes, except... Except what? Well, it, what's she got to do with it? Nothing. We can still be good friends. You know, I feel so comfortable when you're around, Kaz. I feel as if I'd known you all my life. drove on up the river, J.J. She told me about herself, about her folks. Yes, I was going to ask you about that, Kaz. Her parents. Did they have dough? Oh, plenty of it. Good, good. Now, this is getting more interesting. Go on. Well, we drove until midnight. And finally, came to a little town. You know, one of those nice little... Sleepy? Uh-uh. I could drive on like this forever. You don't mind my head on your shoulder. No, I, I like it there. Where are we? Just outside uh, Mayfield. Mayfield? Yep. Know, know someone here? Oh, Kaz, isn't this the place where they have so many runaway marriages? You know, by Justice of the Peace, people come from New York so they won't have to wait. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess it is. Kaz, you you didn't pick this road deliberately, did you? No, I, well, I swear I didn't, Isabel, but... But Isabel, uh, do you believe in predestination? I never thought about it, Cass. Do you? Well, I never did, but tonight I, I almost feel I could. Look, Cass, that sign there, underneath the light. Wilfred Grunkel, Justice of the Peace. Great Caesar, Cass. You mean you married her? That's right, J.J. We got married by the Justice of the Peace that night. Good grief. I see. I see what you mean by saying you're in a very peculiar situation. J.J., I've got to get to the bottom of this whole thing. I should think you do, my boy. But how? Where's my bag? I'm going to Chicago. Right now. Now, before our stars return with Act Two of Casanova Brown, I've got a Christmas quiz for Libby. What kind of a quiz, Mr. Kennedy? I say a word, and before this bell rings, you'll give me the first word that pops into your head. Okay. What's the first one? Christmas. Tree. Good. Now, uh, mistletoe. Oh, kiss. <laughs> oh, just made it. Here's another. Stockings. Lux. But, Libby, you were supposed to say presents. You know, the presents in the stockings. <laughs> Not me, Mr. Kennedy. When anyone mentions stockings, I just naturally think of washing them with Lux Flakes. Now, if you'd said presents, then I would have said stockings, because stockings are one of the most popular Christmas presents. In spite of no nylons? Oh, my, yes. The new rounds are so lovely, girls really like them now. And there are lots of interesting new cotton meshes for country and sportswear. You win. Uh, holly. Uh, wreath. Chimney. Stockings. Oh, no, I, I was thinking of Santa Claus. But I see what you mean. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care. Mm-hmm. Although, of course, nobody would ever hang good stockings by a chimney or any other kind of heat. The right care for those Christmas stockings is gentle luck care. I see I can't get your mind off stockings, Libby. So I'll just add that strain tests prove stockings washed with gentle luck flakes last twice as long as those washed with strong soap or rubbed with cake soap. Like this. You get twice the wear from every pair with gentle luck care. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of Casanova Brown, starring Gary Cooper as Kaz, Joan Bennett as Isabel, and Thomas Mitchell as J.J. Not many men learn on their wedding eve that they may be the father of an unsuspected heir resulting from a previous unadmitted marriage. But true to the best traditions of his namesake, Casanova, our Casanova finds himself in this somewhat odd predicament. In his bachelor rooms, he tries to explain the situation to his prospective father-in-law. 
who takes it as probably few fathers-in-law would. But why do you want to rush off to Chicago? Because I want to know the truth. I don't want any secrets between me and Madge. Madge? You're married to Isabel. Get you out of being tied up to Madge. I'm not married to Isabel. Huh? Her parents had the marriage annulled. Oh, they didn't take kindly to the idea. Well, there were attending circumstances not too uh, helpful. I see. You hadn't been married before that, had you? No, no, it was this way. A few days after we were married, we went over to meet her parents. Home in the suburbs was like a palace. We knew they were upset, so we agreed that I'd wait in the drawing room while uh, Madge went in and calmed them down. I can just imagine what a grilling that poor girl went through. Isabel, how did you meet him? Who introduced you? We we just met at the library, Mother. We we asked for the same book at the same time. Uh, what does he do? He's an author, Dad. Oh, like Mr. Louis Brown's eels? Well, not exactly. They didn't accept Kaz's books. Oh, but it's wonderful, Mother. All about his ancestor, Casanova. Casanova? You married an Italian? Oh, Casanova's a historical character, Edward. Rather fast. Oh. But, Mother, Kaz is nothing like that, believe me. He's kind and gentle. Just meeting him and talking to him will tell you why I fell in love with him. I'll get him. No, no, not yet, dear. In moments like this, there is one place we can always turn for guidance. To the stars. Mother, you're not going to drag that astrology stuff in. Oh, Dad. Now, now, dear. Mother knows this. And the stars know better still. Now, here's the book I was looking for. Astrology and Marriage. Uh, when was he born, dear? His birthday's April 8th. He's 37. April 8th, 1907. April the 8th. Ah. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Dear. Oh, Oh, you poor child. Well, there's nothing to be gained by keeping these facts from him. Invite him in, dear. Oh, the poor, poor child. Has Are they sore? No, no, but be careful, will you? Oh, you're smoking. Uh, yes, I was a little nervous waiting. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Mother can't stand men who smoke. The butler told me, but uh, I couldn't find an ashtray or any place to put it. Oh, hurry, do something with it. Uh, a handkerchief. Here, I'll smother it in my handkerchief. Now, be careful, dear, won't you? You won't do or say anything. I'll do my best, of course. Can I tell you how distressed I am, Mr. Brown? I want you to understand that there's nothing personal about it. Well, I hope not, naturally. Mr. Brown, this whole project is fraught with disaster. I beg your pardon? Do you realize, Mr. Brown, where Sagittarius was on the day of this marriage? Uh, No, I'm afraid I don't. On September 3rd, Sagittarius was in the 5th solar house of Neptune. Oh, really? On that same day, listen closely, Capricorn was adverse, Virgo was discordant, and Taurus, Taurus was in sextile aspect to Venus. In short, catastrophe. But that, that's, uh, that's astrology. Of course. How else would we know how to govern our lives? Do you smoke? No. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, no, that is, uh... I thought for a moment I detected a slight odor of tobacco or something. Well, now, uh, let us turn to your birthday. Uh, excuse me, Mrs. Drury. Yes? Uh, do you mean that you would base your approval or disapproval of your daughter's marriage on that nonsense? Nonsense, Mr. Brown? Couldn't possibly have picked a worse word. You don't believe in astrology, I take it? No, I don't believe in astrology. I don't believe in crystal gazing, and I don't believe in beer suds reading. And if I did, I wouldn't impose that belief on the lives of two people who love each other. What Kaz means, Mother? Even though their marriage spells calamity? What kind of calamity? There's no chance of any calamity in this marriage. Yeah, Captain say, Corner, Brown, no... are you on fire? What? He seems to be burning something in his pocket. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I can't understand it. Handkerchief, handkerchief caught on fire. Careful, dear. Uh, his coat's on fire, too. Well, how do you like that? It must have burned right on through. Yes, and now it's burning the rug. A cigarette. Oh, and look, the chair. Oh, step on it, somebody. The chair's on fire, too. Charles, Charles. Get some water from that vase. This is most embarrassing. Some water, Charles. Yes, sir. Right away. Uh, now, what are you doing to that chair? Well, it got down into the stuffing. I have to pour it out. Oh, look, look out. The curtain catch. Water, water. What did you have in your pocket, Roman candles? Oh, Beat it out. Come help me beat it out. No, no, no. You're just fanning it. 
Where's Charles with that water? Water won't help now. You need a hose. Call the fire department. Fire department? Fire department? No, Edward, no. Telephone. Oh, yes, telephone. Uh, Charles, uh, call the fire department. My word, yes, sir. My word. Mr. Casanova, you're a pyromaniac. That's what you are, a fiend. Yes, 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 <laughs> Well, the firemen have gone. The firemen have gone. The house is gone. Uh, Mr. Drury, uh, Mrs. Drury. Don't you come uh, near me. I, I find myself in an extremely awkward position. You certainly do, if I'm any judge of awkward positions. I know. I, I know I owe you both a genuine, sincere apology. That's good. He burns down a $750,000 house and he apologizes. That's very good indeed. Get away from here. But, Mr. Drury... Isabel! Uh, get away and stay away! Isabel! Come away from that infidel. Well, look, Mrs. Drury. Don't you come near me. I would as soon associate with a time bomb. But, Mrs. Drury, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. I, I know, but don't you understand? An accident? Accident? Is... You call it an accident with Sagittarius in the fifth solar house of Neptune? Sagittarius, my eye. That's downright idiotic. Oh, Cass, please. Listen, Mrs. Drury, you may interpret your life through fingernail pairings, but that's got nothing to do with me and Isabel. You can leave Isabel out of your calculations, Mr. Brown. I will not see her fly twice in the face of astral warnings. Astral warnings? What have I married into? Voodoo worshippers? Cash, you can't talk to my mother like that. Then tell her to shut up about those stars. With Sagittarius in Listen, the... you ignorant old crackpot. I burned that house down. Sagittarius had nothing to do with it. It was me. And now he's boasting about oh. it. <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> oh, mother, what shall I do? Isabel, you've got to listen to me. It was all a terrible accident. I know, but it, it doesn't have to come between us. Cass. Look. I'll make up for it somehow. Oh, I'll... Cass, why did you have to spoil it all? But nothing spoiled, really, Isabel. Or... Or is it? Look at me. No. No. All right, Isabel. I'm sorry for everything. I'm sorry we ever met each other, and I'm sorry for what I couldn't help. Goodbye. 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 And if I can think of any way to turn the law on you, I'll do it. <laughs> That's all, J.J. That was the end. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean by circumstances attending the annulment of the marriage. It happened so fast, I never had a chance to break the engagement with Madge. And then when it was over, I just wanted to forget. To come back here and take up where I'd left off. So, now your first wife may be about to present you with a child on your wedding eve. What are you going to do about it? Go to Chicago, like I said. I can catch the midnight, find out what happened and fly back tomorrow afternoon. But this is a chump idea, even if it is a baby. Why do you have to do anything about it? Well, if it's true, I'm going to make a clean breast of the whole thing to Madge. Cass, promise me one thing. Don't go crashing in there yelling, I'm the papa. You understand? Chicago is a big city. <laughs> a lot of activity, and if there's been a misdeal somewhere... You don't want to be left holding the spare card, do you? I understand. From the moment you step into that hospital, walk on eggs. No matter what anybody says, nor speak of the ink. You weren't even there that night. You were attending a bean supper in the YMCA in Cleveland. And good luck, my boy. <laughs> Ellen Harris Hospital. Good morning. Just a minute, please. Ellen Harris Hospital. Uh, excuse me. My name is Brown, Casanova Brown. Good morning, Mr. Brown. Wait right in here, please, and we'll call you when we're ready. Well, I'm looking for Dr. Martha Zernike. I know, I know. We'll call you as soon as you're to go in. But uh, uh, surely you can tell me something. Well, you have uh, nothing to worry about. Mother and child are doing nicely. Oh, oh, then it is a child. Well, what did you think it was going to be? Now, <laughs> please wait for an orderly in the father's room, Mr. Brown. Two hours. Hmm. I know just what you're going through, bud. If they had nine watches in this hospital, they wouldn't tell a father what time it was. Is this your first? Uh, yes. How long have you been married? Oh, I'm not married. <laughs> what? Oh. Oh, non-union, hey? Here comes an orderly. Hey, what's new? I know, hey, listen, Mr. Brown, will you please come with me? Uh, I wanted to see Dr. Zernike, you understand? Yes, I understand. Just come with me. Uh. <laughs> Okay. Take off your clothes. Huh? Uh, what are you talking about? And put this gown on. For just a minute now, I came here to see Dr. Zernike. I, I know it. Get your clothes off. All I want is a physical exam. Physical examination? Me? Well, you're the father, aren't you? It's a matter of routine. Oh, well. Well, it just seemed kind of funny. 
I've just been over your report, Mr. Brown. It seems you're in excellent physical condition. Well, I'm mighty glad to hear it, Dr. Wernicke. And I want to thank you for coming here. A report like this on file simplifies the case tremendously. We know what possible complications might develop. And in this instance, I would say the baby was very fortunate. By the way, wouldn't you like to see her? Well, uh, uh, is it all right? Of course, right through this door. She's such a darling. Even the nurses have fallen in love with her. Of course, we have to keep them behind this glass partition. But if you look in that third crib, you will see her. The name Drury. There she is. Well, well, what do you know? Like her? Oh, she's fine. But, uh, uh, how would you say she uh, compares with others of her age, uh, her and weight? Oh, perfectly normal. Oh, oh, just normal, huh? Well, perhaps a bit better. And, uh, <laughs> I know this sounds rather foolish, but... Uh, has she all of her her arms and fingers and toes, I suppose? Nothing missing, I mean. A full set. The customary number and variety. Have you seen her mother? Who? Her mother, Miss Drury. Oh, was she here too? <laughs> By strange coincidence, yes. She's in the solarium. Uh, and uh, her parents? Only Mr. Drury, and he's not with her now. Wouldn't you like to see her? Uh, very much, please. It's right down there, into the corridor and then to the right. Uh, doesn't it strike you, and I, I don't say this just because she's my child either, but uh, didn't it strike you that her head seems to be just a little better shaped than uh, uh, usual at such an early age? Oh, there's no question about it. It'll be a very lucky family that gets that child. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Turn to the right, you said. Hmm? That's right. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Yes? What did you mean by the family that gets that child? I mean the family that gets it for adoption. Adoption? What adoption? Well, I thought you understood. Miss Drury's registered the child for adoption. That's why we needed your medical record. Well, who had that fool idea? Well, I'd hardly describe it as a fool idea. Well, do you actually mean you're peddling my daughter to some lazy idiot who hasn't got a family? Miss Drury's title to the child is clear and legal. Well, what about the father? Well, what's he supposed to do? Just stand around and twiddle his fingers? Really, Mr. Brown, these are matters you must take up with Miss Drury. If you'll excuse me. Certainly. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, hello, Cass. Look here, Isabel. What's this about, uh... Oh, gee. Isabel? <laughs> hey, you, you look good. Thank you, Cass. You're looking quite well yourself. No, uh, uh, complications? No, isn't it wonderful? I was so scared. I suppose everybody is, but everything went right on schedule. Did you see the baby? Did I? Oh, oh, yes. Say, what's the idea of giving my baby away? Your baby. Isn't it? Technically, yes. All right, then. What's the idea of giving my technical baby away? If you're going to raise your voice, Kaz, I'm afraid you'll... I'll have to go back to my room. I'm not raising my voice. I just want to know what's the idea. If you're going to shout... I'm not shouting. I'm... <clears throat> I'm sorry. I... I'm not excited, that's all, but... But what is the idea? I'm afraid you forget, Kaz, that I'm under no obligation to account to you. What I choose to do with my baby is my own affair. Well, that's a fine attitude. However, suppose a girl was thinking of getting married again. Suppose this marriage meant the chance of a lifetime for perfect happiness. What are you talking about? Suppose this man idolized you, even as you loved him. Would you take the chance of destroying this whole future by suddenly presenting him with another man's child? Great, Scott, are you planning to get married again? I said suppose. Well, that's ridiculous. You can't marry anybody. Why can't I? Because uh, uh, you're a mother. Well, that's not stopping you. What are you talking about? I'm not a mother. You're a father and you're getting married again. Well, who told you that? I read it in the paper. What paper? The Rossmore paper. That's what paper. Huh? How'd you get a hold of a Rossmore paper? What difference does it make? It's true, isn't it? You're getting married tonight. Well, but that's different. Oh, I... is it? Then how would you like to go to marriage tonight and say, Look, darling, I've got a little surprise for you, and then flash a baby? Well, of course. All but... right, if you don't want your happiness spoiled, neither do I. But you can't do it, that's all. You just can't throw that baby away. And you can't marry that creep you've dug up either. But you'll be happy, Cass. But happy with other strangers? But everybody's a stranger to a newborn baby. She doesn't know anybody. She knows us all right. Oh, that's absurd. Why didn't you write to me? Why didn't you write to me? You knew I loved you. You knew there was no one else on earth in the world for me, no matter how nutty your mother was. How was I to know? After the way you left. Well, that fire was an accident, darling. Believe me. I waited and waited nothing. Not a word. I waited until... 
until it seemed foolish to wait any longer. So far as I could see, you just forgot. Forgotten? I've never forgotten. Oh, don't, Kaz, please. It's true, darling. I've tried again and again, but I can't forget you. Please, Kaz. You're in love with someone else. Me? Who? You're engaged to be married. That's right. Holy mackerel. Oh, Kaz, why did you wait so long? Isabel, uh, look, uh, I've got to catch the plane home, but before I get out of here, you've got to do something about that baby. It's too late, Kaz, and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, isn't there, huh? Well, we'll see if there's nothing I can do about it. Hello? Yes? Chicago? Uh, Mr. Farris? Yes, he's here. Chicago calling you, Dad. Chicago? Who's he calling from there? Hello? Yes, yes, speaking. Who? Oh, Kaz! Kaz in Chicago! Well, how are you, my boy? Uh, J.J.? Listen, I find myself in an extremely awkward position. What's that blasted noise behind you? Sounds like a baby. It is a baby. I've kidnapped her. You what? Uh, Isabel had a baby. She was uh, going to let it be adopted, give it away. I couldn't let that happen, so I took it. I dressed up like a doctor and sneaked it out of the hospital. Well, how do you like that? <laughs> uh, and where are you now? Uh, in a telephone booth. Well, you can't stay there. Or can you? Uh, listen, what I want you to do is this, J.J., Explain as best you can to Madge and Mrs. Ferris. Then take the first plane and meet me at the Hotel Windsor. Uh, bring some money. Money? Where do you expect me to get money? You know the tight wad that I live with. Well, uh, do the best you can. Well, of course, my boy. I'll try to handle it with all the tact and delicacy of a crooked diplomat. Goodbye. That was Cass. What was it? Just telling me that he met an old friend. But in Chicago, the wedding is at 8. Is he on his way back? Uh, no, he asked me to join him there. No time to lose. Uh, by the way, I should have said a new friend. Very new. We'll be back with Act 3 of Casanova Brown in just a moment. Listen. Superports raid Japan. Carrier planes attack Jap bases. U.S. Task Force sinks Jap ships. Don't headlines like that give you a thrill? Yes, we've started back. Guam and Leyte are just the beginning on the road that leads to Tokyo. But wait a minute before we think the war is won. The Japs still have Burma and the China coast. They hold Java, Malaya, and most of the Philippines. And with them, our sources for a billion pounds of fat a year. No, the war isn't over yet. And it's hard to fight it without that billion pounds of fat the Japs have taken from us. Fat that's needed for the clear plastic windows through which our flyers sight the enemy. For synthetic rubber tires for the planes and life rafts for the Navy. And that's where you come in, Mrs. Housewife. It's up to you to help make up that billion pounds of lost fat by saving every drop left over from your cooking. And keep on saving it. Even when we take those palm and coconut groves again, don't let up. It will take time to restore them. Meanwhile, your government urges you to go right on saving fat. Save every drop of fat from your broiler, your, your frying pan, and the tops of soups, stews, and gravies. And this is important. Be sure to strain it. Some of the plants where your waste fat goes for rendering say that almost half of what they get is not suitable because it hasn't been strained. So don't let's lose any precious fat. Always pour your used fat through a strainer into the tin can while it's hot to get out food particles. Or cool and skim off after other liquids settle to the bottom. Save every drop every day. When your salvage can is full, take it to your butcher. He's still giving four cents and two red ration tokens for every pound. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. As you know, Gary Cooper is now a producer with International Pictures. And after the play, as a brother producer, I'll try to pry out of him some of the secrets of his new job and... You're invited to pry with me. Now here's Act Three of Casanova Brown, starring Gary Cooper as Kaz, Thomas Mitchell as J.J., and Joan Bennett as Isabel. It's Casanova's wedding day in Rossmore, Illinois, but far away in Chicago, the groom is otherwise involved, and very much so. An hour ago, he kidnapped his three-weeks-old daughter from a hospital. And now he's hiding in a hotel room, waiting for J.J. to join them. Meanwhile, Isabel, the baby's mother, has just dropped a bombshell in the lap of Dr. Zernike. Let me understand, Miss Drury. 
You never had the slightest intention of releasing the child for adoption? Oh, I couldn't, Dr. Zernicke, my own child. But I had to do something to get Mr. Brown to come to us. I see, but I can hardly pretend to approve, Miss Drury. The deliberate use of the hospital in a scheme to inveigle the father's interests. But I just had to know if he still loves me, don't you see? And Dr. Zernicke, he still does. He belongs with us. Well, what's done is done. Let's hope for the baby's sake that it hasn't been in vain. I suggest now that you find Mr. Brown, bring in the child, and settle on when you want to leave the hospital. But now I don't know where he is. Well, from your description of his attitude, he won't leave this hospital without the child. We'll find him, but first let's get the baby. Can I help you, doctor? Yes, we've come for the Drury baby. Oh, the doctor took her out. Took her out? What doctor? I don't know. I'm new here, but he had on a mask, and I just assumed he was Miss Drury's doctor. You mean he took the baby and left? He went right out of here and down the hall towards the service entry. What did he look like, what you could see? Well, he was tall with dark brown wavy hair and brown eyes. Yes? I think he had on a brown suit underneath his gown. Taz, that Taz, he's kidnapped my baby. Well, well, Cass. Hey, Jay, close the door. I expected you here yesterday. Yeah, I know. I couldn't get reservations on the plane. Who's that? Oh, this, this is uh, Monica, the chambermaid. She helps me with the baby. How do you do? Good grief. And is that it, what all the troubles have been about? Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, Monica, you, you take her while I fix these scales. She even feels as if she gained. Uh, did you bring any money, J.J.? Money? You know that they cut my allowance just last week? Yeah, I was afraid you wouldn't. With a hundred smackers help? Huh? A hundred dollars? J.J., where did you get a hundred dollars? Well, I picked it up in a little friendly card game on the plane. J.J., I'm worried. Oh, nothing to worry about. I'll probably never see the man again. I mean, uh, about the baby. She's gained two ounces since I took her from the hospital. Was that bad? Two ounces. That's practically a pound a week. Fifty-two pounds a year. So what? A lot of people like big women. Not that big. Why, at that rate, she'll be about 12 feet high and four feet square. At first, I, I thought it might be gland. Already? But now I'm convinced that it's a formula. We've got to find a formula that'll slow her down. Yeah, well, I, I always thought they threw in a formula, like the next pair of pants. No, the, the formula's at the hospital. Now, we've been following these baby books I bought. Why don't you get the formula from the hospital? Well, how can I? You could telephone. Well, they'd probably recognize my voice and trace the call. Well, I could telephone. Well, no, no. Now, if anybody calls, it should be Monica. They'd be less apt to uh, suspect a woman. Who should I talk to at the hospital? Dr. Martha Zernicke. Uh, state 64567. Uh, you'll have to give my name, but that's all. Now don't tell them anything. Operator, get me state 64567. Uh, Dr. Zernicke, what shall I ask? Well, just ask her what the dick you feed a three-week-old baby. And remember, don't answer any questions. What about the telegrams, Dr. Zernicke? Excuse me, please, Miss Drury. Hello? Oh, Dad, Dr. what are we going to yes, do, Dr. Don't Zernicke? Dr. Zernicke, why do you feed a three-weeks-old baby? Well, I'm sorry, but I couldn't possibly prescribe a formula for a baby I don't know, especially over the phone. Who is this speaking? Hello? Hello? Hmm, that's strange. I'm sorry, what were you saying? About the telegram. Oh, yes. Well, Miss Drury, I must say your husband, uh, Mr. Brown, is a most unusual father. He's already sent us six telegrams on the baby's health. And if they're true, you have no serious concern on that score. I've engaged a detective agency, and I'd like to give them those telegrams. Of course, Mr. Drury. Oh, Kaz won't let anything happen to her, I know that, but... I want my baby. And naturally, you do. And as for Mr. Casanova Brown, society isn't safe with him around. Burns down homes, marries girls right and left, steals babies. There's only one place he belongs, in jail. Has the detective agency made any progress? Well, so far, no, but I'm confident that given time, they will. <laughs> Look, look, the formula. Formula? What formula? One from the hospital. See, I got Frank, the bellboy, here to get it. That's right, Mr. Brown. No trouble at all. Hey, look here. Uh, you didn't tell them anything? No, sir. Uh, don't be silly, Kaz. I told them that absolute secrecy was vital. And they, they didn't ask you? Sure, they asked me. The minute they heard me say Casanova Brown, that's the first thing they wanted to know. Where was you? Well, they, they recognized the name? Recognized it? Boy, what did you do to that hospital, Mr. Oh, Brown? You didn't tell them anything, uh, not even your phone number. Phone number? Oh, what would they want with that? I didn't telephone. I went right over to them, like Mr. Ferris said. You went to the hospital? Well, oh, sure. Well, in that uniform? Why not? The hotel don't care. Mm. Uniform? 
home. Great, Scott. I never thought of that. Well, what's the matter with my uniform? Look at your cap, you dummy, in your pocket. What does it say? Hotel Windsor, pride of the... Lo- Gee, Mr. Brown, I... Please, I, uh, let me uh, think. Do you think they'll come for her? You bet they'll come for her. Then why don't you get out of here go somewhere else? Sure. And how easy is that going to be? They've probably got detectives on our trail right now. They'd trace us easily. What'll they do with the baby? Do with her? They're going to give her away. People are going to drop around and uh, look her over like picking out a second-hand car. If they like her, they take her. Well, how can they if you're the father? Now, being a father's not enough. You've got to be a mother, too. Precisely. No <laughs> man born a woman ever gets away from them. Man's not capable of taking care of a child, not according to the courts. He can build bridges. He can fly around the world. He can be president and run the whole United States. But taking care of a child is too much for him. You've got to be a woman for that. Any woman. But uh, well, don't you worry, honey. We're not licked yet. But if you if you're married again, you could keep her, couldn't you? Married? Yes, that's right. Uh, married. The wife. Uh, 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 Monica. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, I find myself in an extremely awkward position. Mm, seems to me I've heard that statement before. The sizzle of the fuse before the bomb bursts. Uh, Monica, are, are you married? Me. Are you engaged? Well, no, not definitely. Uh, what I'm going to say may come to you as somewhat of a surprise. How's that, Mr. Brown? Will you marry me? Do what? Uh, are you out of your mind again? Well, how do you like that? Go on. Go on? Uh-huh. Go on. Oh, well, uh, uh, it must be obvious that uh, I'd never make such a proposal involving my whole life and happiness and the whole life and happiness of my daughter if I hadn't, uh, if I hadn't uh, fallen under the spell of your uh, warmth and, uh, and your attractiveness and... Uh, and? And beauty. Well, you're cute. I'll say that for you. Will you? What do you think, Mr. Ferris? Young woman, the idea of any cerebral effort being pertinent to this proposal is absurd. Uh-huh. All right, I accept. Okay, get out of that apron. We're off to the city hall. Hey, you going to leave that female child with me? No, take her with us. I'll take along a bottle for her feeding. You're going to take the baby with you to get married? Why not? Well, it makes as much sense as the rest of this. J.J., J.J., look, uh, wait right here, will you? We'll be back in half an hour, or I'll call you. I'm sure they said this room. Hey, it's Isabel, and there's somebody with her. Hey, how can we get out of here? I got a maid's key from the bathroom to the next suite. Come on, then, quick. There he is. Or, no, where is he? Sir? Where is Brown? And where's my baby? Baby? What baby? There's no baby here. And what are you doing with those bottles? Uh, just sampling them. With nipples at your age, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, never mind about him, Dad. I want my baby. I don't know what you're talking about. If you mean the infant that belongs to all this apparatus and its father, I don't know where they are. Out walking in the park. Out walking in the park? Very well. We'll sit and wait. Mr. Ferris, when I find you, Mr. Casanova Brown, I intend to demand the fullest penalty the law allows. Ah, Tommy Rock. Oh, Rob. stop it, both of you. I just can't stand it, all this waiting. Well, he ought to be back in the city hall by now. City hall? I thought you said he was walking in the park. Well, you have to cross the park to get to the city hall. What on earth are you doing there? Getting married. <gasps> Again? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he seems to be in a sort of a nuptial rut. <laughs> no, no, it can't be. He is, though. Who made bingo this time? girl by the name of uh, Monica, I think it was. It was something of a whirlwind courtship. Oh, Cass, no, no. Well, what's the matter with her? Where's she going? Probably out for a little air. Maybe something of a shock to her. His getting married. Hello? Yes? J.J.? This is Cass. Is the way clear? Where are you? I'm in room 347 down the hall. Uh, we didn't think it was safe to come into my room. Ah, oh, uh, perfectly right, my boy. I'll call you later. Who is that, Brown? Yes, yes, he's uh, in St. Louis. <laughs> he went there on business. In St. Louis? I-, I thought you said he'd gone to City Hall. Oh, he's a very mercurial young man. Now, while your daughter is wrestling with her emotions in the hallway, what do you say to a little game of gin rummy, huh? Daddy's doing the best he can. Now, 
Here's the bottle. Nice and warm. There. There. See? Jack. Isabel. What? Is she all right? Huh? Why, of course she's all right. Say, how did you get here? I heard her crying from the hall. I'd know her voice anywhere. Oh, Kaz. Kaz, how she's grown. I know. It's terrible. Oh, no, no. She's just perfect. Oh, you blessed, blessed little angel, isn't she? Don't touch her when she's feeding. It makes her nervous. Oh. She's she's very high strung. Not too high strung, is she? No, no, no. Just uh, sensitive. And she hasn't been sick at all? Why, of course not. She had the best of care. Eh, quite concerned about her now, aren't you? All of a sudden. What do you mean? I hardly noticed such solicitude the last time we discussed her. Oh, Kaz. How could I have been such a fool? Please, darling. I'm, I mean, <clears throat> Isabel. Oh. Don't, honey. I never meant to give her away, darling. I might just as well give away my heart. I couldn't live without it. Well, why did you say you were going to? No, because I wanted you to come running to stop it. I wanted you to see her and want her and want me again. That's why I came to Chicago. So it'd be easier for you to get here. Good heavens. That's the truth, Cass. But one little word, just one word. I know. I know now. <laughs> now that it's too late. Oh, excuse me. Bottle's empty. Well, what do you do now? Well, uh, well, after feeding a baby of this age, you hold her like this. Support, supporting the small of the back with the left hand, and then uh, pat her gently. Let me, will you? Okay, but hold her carefully. That's right. Your left hand here. Now, Pat, but not too hard. <laughs> oh, oh, Mama's so sorry. Very gently. That's a ticket. Oh, Kaz, isn't she just a little dream? Well, uh, well, I've gotten quite used to her, of course. But, say, look, what did you mean by now that it's too late? That man, back in your room, he told us. Told you what? What you, what you've done. And I do want you to know, Kaz, I, I do hope deeply and sincerely that you'll be very happy. Me? Oh, both of you, of course. Both of who? Didn't you, didn't you get married this afternoon? This afternoon? No. You mean, you're not married at all to anybody? No. You can't get married like that in Chicago. You have to wait three days. Really? No, no I'm not married to any, to anybody. Are you? No. Oh, Kaz. Kaz, come closer. I, I can't see you. Oh, oh. Well, I'm here, all right. Oh. oh, don't stop patting her. Oh, you sweet little thing. Oh, what am I patting her for? Huh? Don't you know? Well, after every feeding. What? Oh. Now, wait. Wait, I think she's about ready. Listen. Oh, Kaz, isn't that wonderful? Right after each feeding, just as regular as clockwork. Oh, darling, I have so much to learn. But don't you worry. I'll, uh, I'll teach you, Mama. Our stars will be back for their curtain calls in just a moment. Now, Sally has a word game that sounds like fun. You take a word like sweater, for example, and then you spell it out. S-W-E-A-T-E-R. Saying what each one of the letters stands for, see? I get it. You start. S is for sweater, so fluffy and bright. W for wool. You should care for it right. E is the ease with which luck saves your duds. A is for always use lukewarm luck such. T is for roll in a towel to dry. E is for ease it to shape by and by. R is, um, oh, <laughs> radiator. Don't dry them there. Sweaters stay lovely with gentle Lux care. <laughs> That's fun, Sally, and instructive, too. It's an easy way to remember all the important rules for washing woolens. Lukewarm Lux suds, rolling in a towel to remove moisture, easing to shape, and drying away from heat. And that's how to have soft, fluffy sweaters. Lux is so gentle, it keeps precious woolens lovely longer. Here's the way that you had better wash that precious woolen sweater. Lukewarm Lux Flakes, nothing stronger. Help keep woolens lovely longer. And now, back to Mr. DeMille and our stars. Our congratulations go to Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, and Joan Bennett for three excellent performances. Very excellent. 
Uh, Gary, I'd say that uh, being a producer hasn't hurt your acting any. How'd you like being both a producer and a star, Gary? Well, it's kind of hard to make up your mind which one to favor. How do you mean, Gary? Well, when it comes to writing out the checks, do you give yourself a raise or take a loss on the picture or uh, cut your salary and make a profit? (laughs) (laughs) And what finally finally decides you? Well, if I'm playing opposite a lovely girl like Joan and there's a chance to, uh, you know... uh, Yeah, yeah, it's just... uh... Well, uh, I can persuade myself to take a lower salary. Gary, somehow I can't imagine you as an executive behind a desk. You mean, uh, what does he do with his legs? <laughs> uh, oh, you, you ought to see Gary's office, Joan. It's really quite a sight. Full of lariat saddles and pistols, I imagine. <laughs> no, 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 quite the opposite. White and yellow curtains, bottle green chairs, bright red sofas, and a desk of, uh, uh, what is that desk made of, Gary? Pickled pine. How's that? Pickled pine. Yeah. Are the walls plastered too? <laughs> I suppose the picture you're making is a hundred proof. <laughs> what is the picture that you're making, Gary? Well, I guess you'd call it a romantic western melodrama called The Long Came Jones. Oh. We'll, uh, we'll hope to have that picture for this theater, Gary, when it's finished. What do you have on deck for next week, Mr. DeMille? For next week, we have a play that was as big a hit on the stage as on the screen. The 20th Century Fox beautiful drama, Barkley Square. And our stars are Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan. I, I think it's no exaggeration to say that this is one of the great plays of our generation. The story of Peter Standish whose love for the past carries him back into the 18th century, where his love for a girl struggles to overcome the barrier of time that lies between them. You couldn't find a better part for Ronald Coleman, C.B. I'll be listening. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. You certainly did Casanova up brown. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan in Barclay Square. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. This Christmas, while our men are fighting for freedom overseas, Help join the fight against America's great enemy at home, tuberculosis. Buy Christmas seals and buy them generously. Use them on every gift or card or letter. With the threat of wartime epidemics, your help is needed more than ever. Buy extra Christmas seals today. Gary Cooper will soon be seen in the international picture, Along Came Jones. Thomas Mitchell, co-author of the book from which Casanova Brown was taken, appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox. He can currently be seen in Daryl Atzanik's Technicolor feature, Wilson. Joan Bennett is now appearing in the title role of the international picture, Woman in the Window. Heard in tonight's play were Verna Felton, Anne O'Neill, Leo Cleary, Norman Field, Dorothy Scott, Leon Ledoux, Sarah Selby, Charles Seal, Eddie Emerson, Jacqueline DeWitt, and Sharon Douglas. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Casanova Brown, starring Gary Cooper, Thomas Mitchell, and Joan Bennett, has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the tissue-thin soap used by smart housewives everywhere. In the Lux Radio Theater next week, we will have, as usual, our producer, Cecil B. DeMille. This is your announcer, John M. Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Barclay Square with Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan. Oh, you're cooking so delicious. Won't you kindly tell me why? Oh, the secret's very simple. Now I'm cooking with fry. Cakes, pies, fried foods, everything tastes better made with new fry shortening. Yes, them to be a better cook just start cooking with fries.
Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Barclay Square with Ronald Coleman and Maureen O'Sullivan. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.